figure out how to envision the new kinds of education that are developing and how to optimize them. So we're going to the mic. Um, whoa, yes. He works. Technologies um, are, uh, are being put forward. Um, so I, uh, I want to uh, bring together some of the comments that were made. Um, and uh, one topic that, that, that's come up um, in several of the presentations um, is the subject of copyright. Um, uh, but more importantly, um, I think we, we, we had a, a reminder about uh, the fact that this is actually for uh, learning and for education. Um, the discussion that we're having here um, is, uh, is not necessarily about uh, how to configure incentives in order to uh, distribute uh, the, the, the um, uh, rewards of the publication of materials, but actually uh, it's about learning. And it turns out that the first copyright law, uh, the Statute of Anne uh, in England, um, was actually described in its uh, purpose as being for the encouragement of learning. Um, it so happens that as we've uh, uh, developed uh, different agreements over time, um, that part um, has gotten dropped off. And significantly, the, um, the Bern Convention that was, uh, that was referred to by, um, by Heidi uh, uh, was, uh, was a certain stage of international agreement on copyright. And um, as I, uh, I've learned and, and relearned again at the very informative session that uh, WIPO held at the last SECR um, is uh, uh, the, the public interest aspects, um, the social good that copyright is for um, was actually uh, uh, discussed but not um, uh, 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 written down, but not, but not enshrined. And I think that, um, that it's important to remember now that so many of the opportunities have arisen over um, uh, how education takes place. I think Nathaniel for, um, uh, described very well um, all of the innovations that, um, that on so many levels that have taken place. And we now see with very complicated diagrams <laughs> um, that I, I don't know how to do that on a PowerPoint. But um, they, uh, uh, they, they, uh, the, the kinds of relationships between individuals and the way in which, um, the way in which uh, learning takes place um, is, uh, is, is, is a lot more complicated than the publication of a book and its distribution in class and reading it. So um, I think it's important to remember that uh, uh, as a social good, um, as something that uh, uh, education being a public good, um, it isn't necessarily captured uh, by a market. And I think that's why um, to bring it to the subject that I think is at the fore of the policy making aspect of this discussion um, is, uh, is why we're discussing exceptions and limitations to copyright. Um, there are, uh, uh, there's a balance in copyright as, as, uh, as, as my colleague uh, um, from IFPO described uh, between the incentives um, uh, for the creators and uh, for the recipients. Um, as we've seen, it's gotten more complicated, especially in the participatory learning environment where creators um, are also learners and uh, peers are producing. Um, but there's actually something about it that isn't, um, that isn't necessarily about markets and incentives. Um, there's something about it, as, um, uh, uh, as Hong described, um, there are certain aspects of the learning environment that don't necessarily require uh, the payment uh, uh, for, for each individual use of, of, uh, of, of a work. And there are some cases for the sake of learning, for the sake of education, for the sake of the development of, uh, of societies, um, that actually not all aspects of learning need to um, run through the publisher first. Um, the publisher is, is not the educator. Um, and, uh, and I think that, um, that uh, uh, education, as, as, as we see, is key to the social and economic freedom of individuals. It's, the, it's that part of social mobility that, that's actually been opened up and exploded um, uh, in terms of uh, the opportunities on the internet and, and, uh, and with the kinds of connectivity that we have. And so um, 
I think it's important uh, um, to understand what kind of policy making we're trying to do. We're here at the Internet Governance Forum. Um, there are a lot of discussions taking place about how we deal with uh, digital education um, and, and, and policy making. Um, it's actually to uh, WIPO's great credit that they've taken a lead um, in discussing these issues. Um, I understand that there's uh, uh, a study that's, that's um, uh, uh, commissioned or going to be commissioned on, the, uh, on educational uses um, as part of the program uh, on exceptions and limitations, and, and, that's, uh, and, and that's really an important way forward. Um, there's also uh, uh, studies taking place at, the, at APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, um, and, uh, and, and, and extensively studied the different aspects of exceptions limitations in different countries and, and uh, trying to bring together different stakeholders um, so that we can figure out what would be best actually not for the balance of incentives and dissemination, which is the logic of copyright, but for education. Let's actually begin with thinking about what's best for education. And so we have um, different perspectives on it here at the IGF, the Dynamic Coalition on Digital Education, um, uh, met uh, last year. Uh, there hasn't been as much activity, partly is, is because it's, it, it, digital education is so pervasive um, and, and, uh, and, and its representative groups are so hard to identify um, uh, specifically. Um, as, as, who, as who does represent it that, that it, that it's a job in itself to bring together who those stakeholders are. Um, the platform that one would need to have um, would not necessarily be obvious. Um, it wouldn't necessarily include um, the, uh, the repeat players um, that show up at, uh, at, at uh, institutions such as WIPO, but actually reaches out um, to teachers um, and to creators of technology um, and to those who are coming up with uh, different licensing structures. The open educational resources movement um, has actually um, uh, taken over uh, 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 not just um, uh, learning on a very uh, local level, but also uh, has captured the imagination of the largest and wealthiest universities um, in the United States. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, I think the, the Cape Town Declaration is a matter of policy. Um, is something that should be turned to. And so there's a great deal of institutional competition uh, taking place over, uh, over norm setting in regards to digital education. And, um, and, it's, and it's a great opportunity to be able um, to talk about it here and, and especially with, with, uh, with our WIPO colleagues. Um, I think there's uh, one, one thing um, that's specific um, to the discussion of exceptions and limitations worth mentioning um, is the history of, of the three-step test. And again, um, uh, um, uh, my knowledge was, was, uh, was even further edified by the, um, by the WIPO informational session. Um, the extent to which, uh, though not uh, transcribed, uh, the public interest is, um, is, 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 is in uh, the three-step test. Um, it's something that, uh, that, that hovers um, before it, within it, um, around it. Um, it's not something that, um, that is uh, mentioned explicitly, but it's something that drives its very purpose um, to enable that kind of innovation. Um, that, uh, that to, to, to enable the kind of social goods, uh, I, I was getting ahead of myself, to enable the kind of social goods that are uh, necessary by leaving open that wiggle room um, I, I didn't see what that said. Okay. Um, uh, to enable those kinds of um, uses that don't require uh, permission or payment, uh, for example, and that the um, um, and 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 then on top of that, um, in in addition to the fact that we understand uh, copyright as driven as being driven primarily by um, by In, in the cases of uh, education by the social good and not by the economic incentives. Um, we, get, we get a situation here um, in some of the innovation uh, in the participatory learning and the kind of interactive uh, digital learning environments where uh, 
the exceptions limitations that are available in copyright um, are actually what drive the latest innovations. And we have open, opening up uh, the fact that um, uh, many educational contexts make use of YouTube um, in order to teach uh, people. Um, uh, I know in, in, uh, in, in classrooms I've taught in, uh, we've used Facebook um, in order to teach. Um, we've used all sorts of new technologies, um, some of which are, uh, are their, 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 their status in, uh, in copyright are, are, are uncertain internationally. And so um, there is something to be done in regards to uh, copyright and digital education. And uh, that is something that, that um, is very promising um, for there to be leadership in creating voluntary licensing agreements um, as, uh, as, as WIPO is starting to do in other contexts. Um, but as uh, WIPO is also considering um, uh, in the context of the visually impaired, uh, the, uh, the promotion of a, of a treaty um, with minimum exceptions and limitations, which was also thoroughly discussed uh, during, during, uh, during sessions and, and, and is something that is um, uh, pushed for by uh, those groups actually um, who represent uh, the visually impaired, um, such as the case also in terms of, um, in terms of, 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 uh, of education. This is uh, a context where um, we see learning happening and, and, and Diplo has actually proven in, in, uh, in such an interesting way how education happens across borders. Um, it's not something that necessarily, not just, it's not just that it doesn't even happen in the same classroom, that people can be remote, but it happens across borders and the uncertainty that exists um, across, uh, in trans-border uh, uh, transactions um, and, and, and dissemination of works is something that requires the kind of international leadership and international norm setting um, that uh, 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 UN institutions can provide. Um, it's for that reason that um, while pursuing the uh, voluntary licensing agreements um, that, uh, that WIPO is uh, 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 helping generate through platforms um, and that the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, uh, supports um, and, and, uh, and, and, is, and is, is, is praising of, um, there should also be um, a basic level, an understanding, a, 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 an instrument, um, uh, preferably uh, soft law, if, uh, if, if, if the um, dynamics of the agreement struck uh, would be uh, disadvantageous to educational purposes. Um, but for there to be some example, um, in the IGF we have best practice forums, and, and this would be a great place um, to generate the kind of uh, the kind of expectations that can be had in regards to, um, to, to, to educational uses. And this is a place where we could bring um, technologists who understand the way that um, communication networks are set up, and uh, educators who are using these tools in innovation in innovative ways, and people who are entering into licensing agreements that are not just traditional um, in being um, uh, primarily about exclusive rights with, uh, with, with, with some leftover for other uses, but about uh, openness and about dissemination and about the kind of um, uh, creative commons types ideas that, um, that have, that have uh, uh, been opened up. And so um, some kind of standard so that education doesn't just reach um, those countries that have already generated um, their own laws in regards to, uh, and exceptions in regards to how educational uses, but, but in all countries. In fact, um, I think it's a very easy case to make that those countries who have uh, less expertise um, and uh, shorter history in the generation of, of, of copyright law uh, would be the ones who would need to take most advantage of, uh, of educational uh, purposes in copyright. And so um, I think that uh, this meeting here is one of many um, that take place in, in talking about digital education. I think it's clear um, to anyone who's, uh, who's, who's gone online uh, to see the potential of this tool and to talk to young people about how they make use of, of these technologies 
that uh, we're on the cusp of a, of a new era of learning. And, um, and, it's, and it's something for policymakers um, to, to uh, show leadership in um, rather, than, uh, rather than catch up on or uh, try to, um, try to uh, um, triangulate uh, um, incumbent interests. And so um, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to address everyone. I, 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 um, I'd be happy to answer questions and engage in discussion, and, um, and uh, I'll finish with that. All right, uh, thank you, Adon. We have, um, we started a little bit late, so we're going to run over into the lunchtime a little bit, but if anyone needs to leave, we understand. Um, and we'll get just the conversation started now. It'd be great to have some questions from the audience, and to the extent that there's time, if um, panelists have questions for each other, I think it would be really good to have a, have a conversation going. One thing I wanted to say before we got started, which I think came up in almost every presentation, so I wanted to bring it out explicitly, we are starting to talk about now kind of the next step in this conversation, which is we have all of these roadblocks, and how do you go about addressing them? How do you go about minimizing them or solving them or helping education develop in the face of them? And there were really two real questions that it seemed like it came up. And one of them is the level of, address, of, of the address that's appropriate. That is, sh is this something that should be addressed at the community level? Should it be addressed nationally? Does it need to be addressed internationally? as Don was mentioning, it obviously, for the different roadblocks, there are going to be different solutions. But when we're thinking about how to address them, it's really important to think about where should that solution come from, what sort of body, and whether it's something that could be applied across a number of countries and across regions similarly, or if it really needs to be tailored locally. And then secondly, what is the kind of solution that is appropriate? Is it something where regulation or lawmaking might solve the problem? Is it something where really what we need is training and education, which is what Ginger was talking about? Is it something where what we need is innovation and technology or a new platform to make it more plausible? Both of these questions really play into how we're going to address these roadblocks. So I just wanted to lay those out there. Um, does anyone in the audience have a question to get us started? All right. Yes. Really, um, my name is Dinesh Babuta. Um, I'm involved with a lot of things in the UK, and education is uh, one small passion of mine. Um, uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers, and um, just like to say that I don't, I'm not sure whether I'm a traditionalist when it comes to education. Um, I've been a proponent of the internet um, technology since uh, the late 80s, um, but when it comes to education, I do believe, um, as Ginger put it, she said, uh, the teaching experience, and from my point of view, I, I, I'd say the learning experience. Um, for example, this forum itself, um, I came here with some preconceived ideas, but I'm sure that my current viewpoint will change as I hear other questions, and um, I learned some things from you guys as well. Um, and even though I'm a traditionalist um, in that I do believe in the interaction between uh, teacher and student and student to student, um, I do use online technologies such as forums to go and learn things. Um, however, um, I, d I do believe that uh, one, of, one of the issues probably that we need to tackle is um, with companies. Um, companies, for example, um, there was a couple of years ago where I was invited to a round table to talk about digital education and there were lots of companies there, uh, large international organizations, and their main concern was reducing costs. And when they talk about reducing costs, it, it, it's, it's to, um, to have their staff, uh, their employees, move away from spending time in education during work time. Uh, what they want to do is they want people to go home and sit in front of a computer and learn in that way. Now, for me, um, that's not education. Um, because, um, for example, if you want to learn a language, uh, for me, I need to be immersed in, in the whole experience as I call it, the learning experience, um, being immersed where you go into a classroom or it could be some sort of digital technology, but um, you need to interact with everyone in the class because that's the only way to learn a language. I would, I would put a question to everyone here who has learned a language. Have you er actually ever learned a language just sitting at home in front of a computer? Um, you do need that interaction. You need to go to the country. You need to be in that language all the time. So 
from from that point of view, I think one of the one of the um, uh, one of the roadblocks is actually how do we get the message across to the companies? Do we need to educate them on what learning is and what education is? Um, and Ginger, I'd, I'd I'd just like to say that um, slide six uh, for me was uh, something that I've been in a way talking about for quite a while to lots of people, but no one seems to see that. So I'm I'm very glad that slide six has come about. But what would need to be involved to get to that stage, and how far are we? Uh, how far away are we from that? Thank you. Uh, very good comments. Um, I think we are actually developing and using slide six as we are on our way to slide seven, as you said, to developing better. Um, not only do I speak about Diplo because it's my experience, it's a platform I've been working on and developing, and because it changes continually as we see what works and what works better, what doesn't work. Um, and I do some experimenting myself, but we are there building on the text with hypertext. So we build our discussion as though it were in the classroom, student to student, student to teacher, because you're building, I don't know if you've ever worked with hypertext, and so you're building your discussion and you have all the discussion lines going on simultaneously, so it actually gives more chances for every single student to interact and be heard, the shy students, so what, if someone talks too much, well, people just don't read their posts. If, so it does actually bring about a, a little bit of leveling and lets every voice be heard. So between hypertext forum blogging, uh, forums where you can separate out, the teacher can bring out a particular topic or assign a particular topic for, discuss, for further discussion, and then chats. Um, chats is something I've been working on because it's the only synchronous time we have in the Diplo courses, once a, once a week we meet. And uh, first, you, I suppose, as I was less experienced, I would start with a very strict agenda and one person talking at a time, as though we were, were, and we don't need to do that when we're in a chat. We can all talk at once because we're not drowning out the other one. So what we're using now is what we're calling, my students invented this name, it's called the tsunami technique. We just let, throw out the ideas because we know we can read it. We lose time in transmission, we lose time in the lag. We lose time while someone's typing. Let's use that time. So the, the tools are evolving, and I think we really are, are doing uh, slide six, I think, as Nathaniel pointed out, and uh, Eden pointed out, we are working on slide seven. I just, I don't, know what, I don't know what it looks like yet. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Sanat uh, from Sri Lanka. Uh, I'm attached to a university. I'm a teacher, but I'm also involved in uh, to a couple of projects, uh, national projects actually. Now, there was a, uh, something mentioned about what kind of approaches, institutional, personal, national. I think as a, for a developing country uh, like Sri Lanka, it's a national kind of initiative necessary and the government has initiated many. One being, uh, it's called a distance education modernization project where I'm also involved as a consultant and we see uh, uh, the, the basic idea being improved increasing access to education, higher education for uh, many people around the country. Students who are graduating from high school but cannot enter the traditional university because basically the limited number of seats are there. So the digital uh, technology basically gives uh, access is the issue. But at the same time, uh, the access to the technology itself is a problem that the national has to be solved. So many the networks are being spread around, access centers are being set up because people cannot access from homes because they don't have computers and so and also we have the issue of language I think for many countries we should we might find lots of content in various places but uh, how do the educational material the language issue is there uh, I think uh, in many of the projects that we work with the uh, um, main concern is uh, uh, content development uh, how do you develop content so you can lay out the technology you can put computers internet but how do we have the content is a major issue. And we can, of course, use lots of things available on the, uh, even I have seen some of our partners uh, using, as you mentioned, uh, YouTube, and uh, even things called TeacherTube and various things as resources uh, from, from their sites. And, uh, but I think this uh, national effort is necessary, especially for developing 
nations and, uh, uh, and uh, for example, one thing uh, we have done in our is even localizing uh, the learning management systems like Moodle into our languages. So uh, very good that uh, I just want to know if there are any other sessions in this uh, IGF we are talking about identification. I didn't see it. That's the question I want to answer. Um, you might know or you might know, I can mention that there is a Diplo best practices on digital education uh, workshop. I don't have that right on hand. I'll look it up and let you know before the session ends. Thank you. Do you mind me, um, in terms of uh, uh, the example of, of what's taking place in Sri Lanka, one thing that I wanted to mention, the significance of, um, of uh, one aspect of moving towards digital education um, is uh, both the opportunity for greater dissemination and the, the kinds of things that uh, uh, the, uh, in Sri Lanka, the, it seems as though you're saying the, the government is promoting. Um, but in terms of publication, um, there's also a trend in terms of digital products um, of, uh, of uh, technological protection measures or DRM um, that's, uh, that's being implemented and um, uh, one reason that part of this debate is taking place is because uh, uh, there isn't necessarily uh, the uh, same kind of uh, attention given in every country um, to the kinds of uses for education that would be necessary for those products um, that contain DRM. And so that's something that should be brought up and, and, uh, and should be uh, taken note of uh, in, in the implementation of Sri Lanka. So there, there could be lots of great efforts um, taken by the government, but if some of the publications um, have uh, uh, essentially technological locks, um, uh, those efforts can be moot um, uh, because uh, there would be a very limited uh, uh, access uh, with, with little flexibility on, on on the user side um, for those tools, so um, I think that's it's it's a it's a it's it's wonderful to hear the kind of um, uh, initiative that's taking place, and and thanks for the opportunity to also uh, raise that issue and concern about uh, the internationalization of, of of norm setting in this. Yes, do we have another question? Let me then. Um, she's Bryce. From Holland, I have one question for the WIPO representative. Sorry, I missed your name. Um, opening your your uh, your contribution, you said that the inter intellectual property and copyright that they can help digital education. Could you elaborate on that? Fair at the beginning of the presentation about the the, um, the balance of uh, interest that. Uh, copyright laws and copyright treaties um, take into or uh, where uh, the, or this balance that is enshrined in uh, copyright treaties and copyright laws between the different interests. We say, well, copyright law is uh, uh, developed to um, protect creativity, to um, give uh, incentive for um, continued uh, creation. And on the other hand, I mean, we have a set of limitations and exceptions that exist in all international treaties on copyright and also in, in national copyright laws that permit certain uses. Let me elaborate, elaborate more in, in, in the area of uh, um, teaching or illustration uh, activities. Um, in Article 10, 10.2 uh, of the, the Bern Convention, there is a possibility for member states to develop is a possibility, huh? it's discretional for member states to develop in their national laws um, limitations and exceptions for teaching purposes. And there are certain conditions established in this, um, uh, in this convention. It has to be according to the fair practices and fair practices vary from one country to another. And that's why today many laws, national laws, have enshrined this, this kind of exceptions with different, I mean, or uh, different nuance, we can say, uh, uh, different conditions. And uh, as I said during the presentation, we find that um, uses for teaching purposes can vary f uh, from one legislation to another, being from uh, uh, encompassed under the fair use um, 
activities for DLEAD or uh, subject to um, non-voluntary licenses also, because we know also that in the, even in the Bern Convention there is a possibility for developing countries to um, establish a special licenses for um, reproduction and translation of uh, uh, protected material uh, in the area of um, research activities or educational activities. Or, um, well, finally, also uh, the, uh, it, uh, there is also the possibility, and we find that many laws um, also um, uh, establish or, or, or give uh, the possibility to, uh, well, the author to negotiate, to uh, enter into uh, voluntary agreements with the users to facilitate the access to, to the educational material. Perhaps, I mean, I, I, if I take the opportunity and I, I, I would like to, to address, uh, um, to refer to what you say, Eden, about um, uh, digital education across the border. I mean, you, you, sp you spoke about the, the, the need today to use these tools, I mean, these opportunities offered by internet, by digital network, to have access to educational material across the borders. And um, I was thinking, well, um, we find, or many people think that um, copyright laws are ill-equipped, don't offer the opportunity to facilitate this exchange of materials across the borders. But perhaps, I mean, let's think about what kind of standards, of uh, copyright standards, these laws have. Perhaps, I mean, we have these laws are ill-equipped because um, they don't offer um, the possibility of limitations and exceptions in the digital environment, but at the same time, they don't offer the opportunity to um, um, authors or to um, um, uh, any uh, uh, copyright holder to um, uh, protect, to control, to monitor the use of, of uh, uh, his or her content in the, in the net. And I'm talking about, I mean, TPM, Technological Measure of Protections or Rights Management Information. And again, I mean, we are talking about the balance. And this is, a, this is an issue that we are um, um, considering in WIPO. I mean, how to uh, help uh, and or to assist the national legislator to um, craft this balance as well in uh, at, na at national level, local level, and also, um, again, I mean, promote or, or foster the, the exchange of material um, uh, across the borders. So excuse me, one more. So that for education and digital education, uh, at the basis, copyright and intellectual property is not that beneficial. If limitations and exceptions as we need also rights for instance for, well I don't want to go to the technicalities of the treaties, mm -hmm. but if I refer to the uh, WIPO uh, copyright treaties, the recent treaties are, um, adopted by, by WIPO in the area of copyright, uh, we see that there is a um, new right given to the authors to for instance control the um, um, making available in digital networks of material. I mean, I'm talking about, for instance, uploading or uh, downloading. Well, um, this is an act that uh, is, um, um, uh, takes place when you are uploading or uh, downloading material in, in the net. But um, on the other hand, the treaties also recognize the, the need to establish limitations and exceptions. The treaties don't say, let's establish or member states are obliged to establish limitations and exceptions for digital education. They go um, to a, they use a, bro I would say, I mean, a, a more general technique that is called the three-step test. I mean, they say to the country, well, you, if you want to insert uh, uh, in your national law an exception for digital education, then it has to fulfill these three requirements that I mentioned, special cases, normal education, and uh, protection of legitimate interests. And then, well, we find, I don't want to, again, I mean, to go uh, into the details of national legislation, but we find in the European Union, we find that even, I mean, when you are talking about a common directive, Directive 2001, um, uh, that um, encompass the, the, the standards of the WIPO Internet Treaties, we find that the, the development or the, the way countries in the European Union implemented uh, this directive and these uh, rights and the limitations and exceptions is totally different, but taking also always into account this balance between um, um, the use of uh, technological measure of protections and, and uh, uh, the limitations and exceptions to benefit the, the user, teachers, students in general. Thank you very much.
Um, let me just mention here, it's very interesting because what's, what we're debating right now, or one of the things that we're debating is how you address this issue. Even if everyone up here and everyone in this room were to agree on what the correct balance or a good balance was of copyright acceptance and limitations, for instance, the question of how it would be implemented, whether it would be done technologically and you'd leave the, the, the uh, resolution up to a computer, or whether it would be done purely legally and it would be up to the content producers to monitor and determine when something was interfering, that fundamentally changes the impact of what your solution is. So really, you need to, you need to think about a balance and then you also need to think about implementation because the, fr the form is gonna change the impact. And before we go to another question, I just wanted to, uh, just a quick follow-up. Heidi, um, could you speak for a moment to the degree to which there's going to be um, a, a research, so research done on copyright acceptance and limitations through WIPO? I'm sure that a number of people here would be interested in commenting or being involved in that. Where is that? What are the plans for that? And how could we comment or get involved if we wanted to? Yeah, I, I also mentioned that WIPO is um, actively engaged in um, uh, the discussion or the consideration of, of three um, basic exceptions, copyright exceptions, um, the exceptions for um, uh, handicapped persons, uh, libraries, and educational um, institutions. And well, in the area of surveys or s studies, we have already um, presented two studies um, for the first two beneficiaries, um, uh, or in favor of these two beneficiaries, visual impaired persons and and, um, and libraries, then uh, as Eden mentioned, we are um, uh, working on the terms of reference for the, the next study, which is the study, where will be a very broad study on uh, exceptions and limitations for educational purposes that we will publish next year, and then it will be submitted to the consideration of member states. I don't want to talk about the results of the study right now, but there, there was a very interesting finding um, regarding the study on libraries that we m presented this year, a few months ago. It was elaborated by a professor, prepared by the professor from the University of Columbia. And um, he, m uh, when, when I was reading the, the conclusions of the study, it was uh, really interesting. I found really interesting that, well, among the 100, almost 150 laws that um, he m um, analyzed, he found that only 20 laws, national laws, didn't have any exception for libraries. So we are talking about, uh, uh, well, if we take into account the membership of WIPO, more than 180 countries, we are talking about, well, 10% more or less of, uh, or less, 10% uh, of uh, countries that don't have any national exception. And he also mentioned that many of the, um, the libraries were struggling about problems that were perceived as copyright problems, but essentially these were not copyright problems. They were, well, uh, if you let me uh, list them, they mainly, they, uh, he mentioned that they were just struggling with the technological change. They were, well, they, uh, it had uh, to be taken into account the economic condition of the library, I mean, to afford the digital infrastructure, let, let's say, to, to facilitate um, uh, content through, um, digital network, and also the implementation and education of all this, um, of these different tools. So um, I don't say that copyright exceptions for libraries are not um, necessary. They are necessary. We need copyright exceptions for libraries, especially uh, for digital preservation and uh, different uses. But um, on the other hand, I mean, uh, there are many um, obstacles that are perceived perhaps as copyright obstacles, and not necessarily they are like that. Perhaps, I mean, this will be a very interesting finding for the, the next study next year. And just out of curiosity, um, the finding, the 10% the finding, was there any sort of second order study done about the scope of the exceptions? So, I mean, of the scope of the exceptions uh, the, the, for the, the 160 yeah. countries that do have them, was there any sort of looking at sort of the range from yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, broad to narrow? They are very nuanced. I mean, we find very detailed um, exceptions uh, for, for um, uh, libraries, especially for uh, digital uses, and we find, and perhaps this is the majority of cases of um, uh, national laws that got copyright exceptions, uh, or general, uh, one general exception, that, well, sometimes I say, well, ambiguity um, is sometimes in favor of the user. I mean, the more ambiguous the, the, the exception is, perhaps, I mean, the more permitted uses you, you have. We're getting low on time, so we can probably take one or two more. Please. 
I had, I had a question for uh, Heidi Lung from WIPO. My name is Thiru Balasubramaniam from Knowledge Ecology International. I was just wondering if you could perhaps elaborate a bit more, if you could, about the sort of uh, architecture of this stakeholders platform you mentioned with respect to the limitations and exceptions uh, for the visually impaired. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. As I said, I mean, we are about to launch this um, um, stakeholder platform. It was um, a decision of the, um, of the member states, and well, you, you participated in the latest session of the Standing Committee on Copyright. And one of the main um, uh, decisions for uh, in the topic of limitations and exceptions was to establish a, a, a stakeholder platform under the auspices of WIPO. That means that um, stakeholders will, co will come, and we are talking about publishers, authors, um, uh, collective management societies, uh, organizations, but also the uh, um, uh, members of the visual impaired community to um, discuss uh, the different uh, possibilities to, to facilitate the access of uh, material in a um, uh, special format for um, uh, visual impaired. We, are, um, we think that uh, uh, it will take place or this uh, platform will be launched uh, uh, at the beginning of next year. Uh, I understand that they are working on the terms of reference because it's up to, to them to decide the terms of reference, uh, what they want to, to, to discuss, and WIPO will uh, facilitate the, the discussion. This is what I can say so far. One last question. Thanks. Hi. And um, which, to me, seems like at best a speed bump on the way to digital education, and not really a true roadblock in any way, because there are plenty of workarounds that exist today. And you know, we're really talking about, you know, changes along the edges to copyright to really make this work. So, from your perspective, do you feel like that this really is the, the most important roadblock to moving toward uh, more effective digital education, or that there are things that we should really be focusing this discussion on that are outside the scope of copyright law? Coalition, Coalition for Digital Education, and this year's theme is the copyright protection. So actually, they have held to the theme of this year. And there is, so there's a very solid reason. They're not insinuating that it is the most important topic. It's what we've studied during the past year. And I'm sure for next year, we'll have something else. Actually, if anything, it was very nice of them to let me come in with my outside view. Because as an educator, of course, I think education, uh, learning is the most important topic. But this is an important topic for all of us on how we get our materials. But while that's a very valid question, there is a reason that it happened that was the theme for the year. Did you want to? So does that answer your question? Definitely, thanks. Yeah. I just wanted to mention, uh, Ginger mentioned that there was another, there was at least one other panel during this, during this conference that would be dealing with education issues, and it's the Best Practices Workshop on Internet, internet Governance and Capacity Building. It's going to be on December 5th at um, 4.30 or 16.30, and that's in room 7. All right? Well, thank you all very much for coming, and please join me in thanking our, pre our presenters. Thank, thank, let's thank the audience, a great audience. <laughs> very patient. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>